Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the Young Professionals Network program series, Our Future with AI, a conversation with Professor Jung Lim. My name is Jamie Ju, and I am Development Program Associate at the Korea Society. Usually, I will prepare opening remarks for the program, but ex exceptionally for today, I asked ChatGPT to write one for me. <laughs> Presenting the remarks will be another AI-powered service, IBM Watson's text-to-speech. Let's see how they did. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and esteemed members of the Korea Society's Young Professionals Network, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the latest episode of our highly anticipated Young Professionals <laughs> Network series titled Our Future with AI. As an organization dedicated to promoting understanding and cooperation between Korea and the United States, the Korea Society recognizes the vital role that artificial intelligence plays in shaping our global future. In this episode, we are truly privileged to have Professor Jiang Ki Lim from Parsons School of Design as our esteemed speaker. His extensive research and innovative thinking in the field of AI have made significant contributions to the advancement of technology, inspiring both academia and industry to explore new possibilities while addressing the ethical challenges that come with it. Additionally, this event will also delve into Professor Lim's background as a Korean American, shedding light on his unique experiences and perspectives that have shaped his professional journey. We are also delighted to introduce our distinguished moderator for this episode, Mr. Tae Young Woo. As a visionary entrepreneur and the co-founder and CEO of Finestra, Mr. Wu is well equipped to facilitate meaningful dialogue and foster collaboration among diverse stakeholders. His ability to engage participants and guide conversations will ensure that our discussions remain insightful, balanced, and thought-provoking throughout the series. We encourage you to actively participate in the discussions ask questions, and share your ideas. By fostering open dialogue, we can cultivate a deeper understanding of the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead in our future with AI. Thank you, and we wish you an enlightening and inspiring journey throughout this episode and the entire Young Professionals Network series. Yeah, so you guys just witnessed the two AI software took over my job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so without further ado, please join me welcoming Professor Chang Gi Lim and Tae Young Woo. So, who do I thank for that introduction? Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you. What's, what's their name? OpenAI. Is that OpenAI? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jamie, and OpenAI for the introduction. Um, um, this is a very special moment for me personally because, um, and I've, I've told this um, about nine years ago, I was an intern at this organization um, as a young college student. I was about 20, 21 years old. And whenever events like this were held, I would be the one setting up the papers <laughs> and putting the water bottles in the, the old Korea Society office back on 3rd Avenue way back when. Uh, so now a new decade and a completely new world of technological advancements later. It's, it's a great honor to be a moderator for the event, uh, to come back full circle. And when uh, we briefly had a talk uh, last week, we chatted over Zoom, and Professor Lim wanted a, a Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah style uh, <laughs> moderation. So, yeah, I think he has very high expectations of the, the questions and the conversation today. So I'll try to do that. Um, so today, the people who are watching, I believe, are about, they, there's two types of people who are watching us today. I'd say one type are those who are just kind of generally interested in AI and what is this big buzzword that's going around in the media? How is this going to impact us today and moving forward? Uh, the second group, I assume, are there are students and people, professionals who are actually working in the field, who are interested in about you know, career opportunities, how the industry is going to move, and how the trends, are, uh, trends will evolve. Um, could I just a show of hands show, are there any uh, students, currently students at school here? Yeah, yeah. There's just a few. Um, uh, working professionals below five years of experience. Okay, 
Uh, below 10? All right, I won't ask for more. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it, it does seem like we do have a diverse crowd, so we'll try to touch on a lot of different topics. Um, Professor Lim, you have had quite a fascinating career. You've done, um, you've started your own company. You've, um, as an immigrant, you've had obviously had a lot of different experiences. You've also done like human rights advocacy, and now as the youngest Korean American to join the faculty of Parsons, um, I wanted to allow you to kind of include portions of your upbringing in the conversation that we have, but really want to take most of the time really diving deep into the work that you do. Mm -hmm. So I want to start off today with asking you about your field of work. Mm -hmm. You specialize in transdisciplinary design. Mm -hmm. That sounds very transdisciplinary. Um, so can you clarify what that concept is? And can you share a bit about how you came to this place? Thank you. Well, thank you, Korea Society, for this amazing opportunity. Taeyong, you're off to a great start. I think Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noir would have asked the same question. Um, I don't expect anything less. Um, transdisciplinary design is a, yeah, it's a mouthful word. There's a lot of syllables and words in there. But the concept is pretty, pretty simple. As we think about either in academia or in industry, it's easy to see that we operate in a silo. So uh, whether it's a certain types of field and academic study, that is in anthropology or the field of design or in computer science, um, certain types of groups develop some ideas and concepts, but as we are operating within our own silo, the concepts and ideas might be too limited within their own scope. So the approach then of how can we then create knowledge that does not necessarily fit into one mold, one concept, one framework. So in that idea, the idea of a transdisciplinary design kind of comes in, which is to looking at different fields and seeing what are some of the common themes and ideas or certain things and phenomena that do not necessarily fit in within the mold. And then understanding that using the methodology from all across different disciplines to develop some new theories. So it's very, um, it's very meta to an extent. Mm. What kind of industries or companies do you usually work with on like a regular basis? The, what kind of companies are engaging in the idea of transdisciplinary design? Uh, let's say like you as you personally, like in your, like the usual work day, what kind of industries do you mostly uh, interact with? Well, as a faculty member, I think a lot of my day-to-day -day interactions with my students and colleagues and other academic institutions, um, but also what's fortunate uh, aspects of being a faculty at places like Parsons is that um, I have the network and upon which to collaborate outside. Mm. So whether that is a um, community organization that's focusing on um, uh, certain Asian groups, groups diaspora around the world, to a major international organization that focus on governance, um, to a magazine that uh, specializes in art, art scenes and souls. So it all depends on every day. Um, every day is a little bit different. What um, could you share briefly about like your education background? Um, how like what led you to this field? Uh, the field of transdisciplinary yeah. design. Well, I think. I guess I don't really fit in a one mold in that story neither. Um, I grew up in Seoul, so I went to um, um, I went to schools uh, from kindergarten to elementary schools to I uh, went up to the first year in high school, and then from that point on, I transferred to start studying abroad in the United States. Uh, so I went to a small Christian high school in Indiana, next to a cornfield. Um, living with host families and learning different things. Um, from that point on that I start to thinking about what are some of the things that I can learn that can actually make an impact. And I think it, that kind of drive was always within me. So during my college studies, I was really passionate about um, both international relations and human rights advocacy. Because I did consider that if our grandparents' generations in Korea was fighting for the national rights, because within the Korean history, they were fighting to achieve the national independence uh, from the foreign powers. 
to the context of today and then with our generations, I felt strongly that as a global generations that human rights is something it's it's a something that we as a generation um, is seeing as a challenge and has to try to achieve around the world. So with that focus, my undergraduate study was focusing on the human rights advocacy and also United Nations uh, policies and reforms. So that was my undergraduate studies. Afterward, as a Korean man, I go back and serve in the military for two years, um, which was great because, first of all, I had a secure job after college. Government was just waiting for me. Um, I have a place to sleep. There's three meals a day. Um, another thing is it was also time for me to give back. Um, throughout my study abroad, I've seen many cases, uh, people without nations, uh, people with countries that are affected by uh, international turmoils. Um, they're in challenging situation. My country wasn't like that. And um, so it was for me also, I th thought about it as a time to give back. So two years in military service. Um, afterward, I came back to New York to study in public policies and also a field called urban science, which is applying data science and um, tackling on different urban issues uh, through data-driven approach. So I think that was kind of the catalyst upon which I started to think about more and more about the roles of technologies and usage of it can actually tackle on like a complex challenges. So listening to your background, I'm thinking when I'm assuming when people saw like design and AI, um, average people like me, when we think of the word design, we think of art and, you know, uh, artistic talents. So when especially people at like a very young age, if they show artistic talent, they're kind of encouraged to go into the design field. Um, and if you don't show that, like me, um, you're kind of told to stay away and do something more technical. Um, but thinking, um, listening to your background, it's not a very kind of arts related field. It was a very kind of human relations. Um, so it was very much more in the humanities. Now you've settled at now you're at Parsons, one of the most like well, well known design schools in the world, um, teaching in this field of transdisciplinary design. It feels like the word design, the concept, has expanded so much. Mm -hmm. um, how how did you experience like what was your first kind of interaction and experience going into the design world? Well, Taeyong, if I met you on the street, I would definitely consider you as an artistic person. Check. <laughs> Um, the the way you convey ideas and the way you, way you kind of compose thoughts, I think those are very creative and very artistic. Um, and I think that's another way we can think about the idea of design as well. Uh, design as a concept has expanded. Um, of course, design as an ideas uh, in the, within a Western history context has used to mean very specific things. Focus on forms like this. How can we make this so that it's functional? How is it used using these materials? But the idea of design has gone beyond just focusing on how can we manufacture this to can we apply the process of designing things into other things as well, such as organizations, such as public policy, such as new technology. So from my point on, I think that's also what was very welcoming about um, how I started getting involved in the design community and Parsons and my work has been I'd start connecting with people who had that open-mindedness of where the design is going and what different thoughts and ideas are welcome in that space. And as soon as I found that group that was thinking in that way, I think I was incredibly drawn to it um, and start embracing those concepts and interested in building those ideas and movements further. So if somebody wants, somebody in this audience wants to do what you do, they want to kind of build the same, a similar career as you have, what do they study? What do they need to learn? And what do they need to know? Well, first of all, nobody should try to live as like somebody else. <laughs> um, and second, the, haha, <laughs> this is coming from someone who works in a higher education. Um, you know, most of the times what we study is not what we do. What we study in the educational institutions and places influences how we think or how we approach certain things. So I think for me, um, what do I study if I want to have a career like me? Um, 
I think I will study how to how to how to learn things. Meaning, I think there's never a point in my life that I was not learning. I was constantly engaging in new methods, new organizations, new ideas, new field. Uh, notions of design wasn't new to me, right? Um, I think learning how to learn is the most one of the kind of greatest gift that I receive in educational institutions. Before I kind of dive in more deeply into the fields of design and AI, um, I'm just curious um, about any like recent projects, just to kind of share with the audience an example of, of like what kind of project and what kind of role you play um, at school. Like if there's any research or mm -hmm. other uh, projects that you take. Yeah, I think one of those example is. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now with both uh, within the network that I have at Parsons and also uh, with Alto University, where I'm currently uh, pursuing a doctoral degree uh, in this uh, research, in this AI and education, um, and also in the collaboration with LG AI Research, is notions of how can these types of AI technology can influence in a creativity development. So we know that these types of generative models of AI, um, an AI system that is able to generate text and images, kind of like a ChatGPT we saw, how can those types of tools um, be positioned within a learning environment where it's not hampering or limiting someone's creativity development, but rather encouraging it and enabling it and allowing that person to, to discover something more on their own. So for that, I create like academic research, empirical studies. Oftentimes there's robots. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's no robots, but robots ones are more fun. Um, and then we, uh, we analyze that and we, we talk about that and publish those uh, results. Since you brought up the, <clears throat> the partnership with LG, I just want to go dive in a little bit deeper into it because Parsons announced a three-year partnership with LG. Um, LG AI Research. Um, could you share a little bit more about what the partnership is and what the goals of that uh, research is? Yeah, and I think this is very much um, important about when I think about the roles of academias and the roles of uh, um, these types of careers are. Oftentimes when we think about academic journeys, it's focusing on generating new types of ideas and forging it and trying to get those ideas out to impact other people. Um, and also teaching is a huge component and there's tremendous value in it. But in the corporate partnerships um, with, that we're doing with LGI research, really kind of positions the relationship academia in a way that we can actually not only be able to pursue an academic research that we want to go, but also in that journey, we're co-designing what these types of technologies can be in the field of create, uh, creative industry. So. The partnership right now is focusing on doing academic research and studies. So uh, LG AI Research is an R&D arm within the giant, uh, big LG uh, corporate, uh, corporations. So they're also interested in pursuing these, like how these types, types of technology can be used, what types of new types of AI models can be, can be effective. So along with that, with our interests at Parsons Community, there's a looking at how can these technologies can be incorporated in a meaningful way. We see a lot of alignment. So that kind of led to uh, developing an academic partnership that are going to pursue both hosting events like this um, to creating uh, academic research activities uh, that's both around New York and Seoul and other places. So there, there, the initial partnership is a three-year partnership, I've been told. What would success look like for this partnership? If there is any kind of set objective. Mm -hmm. I think the success of this, this partnership is if we are able to both develop a new way to understand and think about how these types of technology is being perceived as creative and also how these types of technology can, can foster humans' creativity in a meaningful way. If we can kind of figure out their models and ideas and able to share that with the world, um, I think that would be like aspirational goal. Mm -hmm. Concretely, what does that mean? There could be a symposium, there could be an exhibition, there could be a different types of academic research activity 
that can really build on the momentums of all other researches that's been going on around the world uh, as we speak. It is a very kind of research-based partnership where the corporation and the school are working together to find out new ways to kind of educate and to share that information yeah. with the world. Yeah, and I think that's something that I see as, I think I, and I think on my personal journey, I kind of reflect upon what kind of what kind of combinations thing can make a meaningful impact in a timely manner. So both having been in large government organization uh, like military, to um, having been part of a uh, public policy arm of the New York City Councils and working there as an intern, um, seeing how the policies work, um, managing my own tech startup that was uh, focusing on trying to release a product into the market. I think throughout that experiences, I start to notice what could be the good combinations of resources and talent that can make an impact, but at the same time, and timely impact, but also uh, focus on the mission. So within that, I think this partnership is one of those articulations of, my, of those ideas and my desire of what types of uh, combination can make uh, maximum impact at the shortest amount of time. So this event is titled Our Future with AI. And I'm pretty sure most of the people here have tons of thoughts and questions about AI. So I was kind of personally trying to hold off on the big buzzword in town for a bit, but I have to bring it up. So ChatGPT, I'm sure you have a million thoughts about it. I'm sure you have a million thoughts about it. So I want to share, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of share freely about what you think about that, um, that feature, the program and how it's impacting people. What do you think this audience should know or think about as they learn about and engage with generative AI programs like ChatGPT? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most important aspects here is at the end of the day, AI is just another designed objects and things. It is made by people with certain influences and values and disciplinary by, uh, tendencies. So if it is made by somebody, that could be also unmade by people. That could be also shaped in a certain di direction. I think we do live in, in both media narratives and, and, and public consciousness that when a new technology comes out, certain futures are inevitable by the direction upon which that technology is moving. But that is simply not true. Any technological development is influenced by the people who are engaging in it, making it, and fostering it. If we can take part in that and bring different perspective in shaping what that technology can be, then what we understand as AI today can be very different uh, tomorrow. So you talk about taking a proactive approach to engaging with and learning about um, AI. So I'm curious because um, we at home, you know, read about AI all the time. You know, ChatGPT created this, this new AI powered search engine does this. Could you give us a bird's eye view of what the AI world is like in your position right now? Mm -hmm. Like you as, you know, you're a faculty, you do research specifically, specifically in this topic. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know, is, is AI like, is there a lot more for, to come that we don't know yet? Um, like, is it, is everything being shared? Um, how can we influence it? What's kind of your bird's eye view? Yeah, I think one way we can think about concepts like AI is that even though it feels new, but it's nothing new about this idea. The idea of a human-made artifact that has a lifelike effects and having functions and we interact, these types of concepts exist in many different civilizations from a long time. You know, Western civilization, there are concepts like columns and the mythologies, uh, Greek mythologies. There are these uh, statues that comes into life. Even in East Asian um, civilizations and mythologies and concepts, we have different incarnations of things that are coming into life at night and, 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 bring, and, and acting like people, and people are falling in love or engaged with those. So the concept of these at objects coming into life has already existed in the past. The difference of 
it now is we come to the point where um, advancements in latest computer sciences and uh, has led to developing tools that is able to function or manifest some of those aspects that we have. But if we think about how, if we look at our histories and look at all different examples of these kind of artifacts coming into life, to looking at these kind of computer science and uh, artifact that we create, and also as a society coming up with scientific and science fictions and stories about androids and AIs and other things, something that's really uh, important for us to think about is these types of AI, to an extent, is within that certain time, within the historical times and cultural time, they're always engaged in this dialogue about themselves through construction of these ideas. So to an extent, um, AI, as we know it, is a dialectic artifact. It causes us to engage in conversation. What are our society's value? Where are we going as a society? What do we mean by as a humanity? Who do we give more rights versus another? Every society and every civilization engage in that cathartic conversation through this um, manifestations of AI. What's interesting is the latest AI models um, that is getting a lot of fundings and the methodology of AI um, that is very much um, is called sub-symbolic approach, meaning that instead of a creating an um, autonomous artifact that is command-based and a logic-based, we're creating an um, it's almost like a advanced statistical model that is based on a lot of data uh, that have been coded and, uh, by humans or by a machine itself to distinguish certain features to generate these types of models that is able to kind of create this human-like features and text and ideas and so on. So to an extent, um, this idea of an AI is reflecting the society. Conceptually, we thought about it as something interesting in our science fiction. It's kind of coming into life. And we see it a lot when there are AI models that people engage in, uh, either by a tech company releases it or in the open source world. Uh, oftentimes, an AI model that without any moderation and re reflecting on the internet, the like contents of the internet itself, you see the beauty in it, and also you see the very augments of it. So you mentioned you talk about like creating artifacts, creating them in like new, breeding new life into uh, creating new projects and products. So if you think about the creative industry, especially, mm -hmm. I feel like the foundation of it is kind of the understanding of originality and the consensus of uh, the concept of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So in recent years, we've had um, recent years, recent months, we've had phrases thrown around like, you know, AI created this. ChatGPT made this for me. So let's say, for example, if I prompt an AI program to create something mm -hmm. and it creates it for me, is that mine? Is that the program's? Is that ours? How do we decide? What do you think? I tried. I, I, I spent a lot of time crafting this question, <laughs> not, not thinking that I would answer it. Um, I think, I, th I think that the person who prompted it can't really claim um, the whole response as the person's because the the prompting, um, like the the program, mm -hmm. utilized data from a lot of other people and a lot of other data that was ultimately created by a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of co-creating an idea is kind of what that's what I feel like of course my thoughts and ideas can change and you know how the world of intellectual property and how like that can definitely shift and I'm sure there are a lot of debates right now about that so I'm not the one that's supposed to be answering the question today <laughs> so I asked the expert what 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 do you think well the there is an aspect of it a lot of the output, even the things that we saw today right. uh, in the beginning of this event by ChatGPT, um, these are a der derivative artifact. Derivative um, is based on a lot of trial uh, training data and then based on those features that have been able to extract 
uh, put it in a certain combination. Um, what we heard was a very beautifully made word salad. Right? Excellent word salad. I love that salad. The salad sound, like, tastes like a real salad, uh, but it's a word salad. Um, and there's a value in that types of work, um, especially when it's the work itself is not trying to create something original or trying to change something else. So one of the concepts um, spoken of oftentimes in the field of computational creativity, so this is a computer scientist and is a multidisciplinary research group that focuses on creator machines. Um, Margaret Bowden is one of the th leading thinkers in this space. And she talks about the three different types of creative behavior that can be done by machine. One is combinatory, mixing, mixing, mixing new things. Exploratory, within a certain domain, you're pushing these ideas as far as you can. And the third is transformative creativity. What are the things that can actually change the paradigm that exists? Do something totally new that did not exist within those concepts. Now, Dr. Bowden talks about these types of works, all three things are possible within the computational system through different measures and methodologies. But what I do see in engaging both in my research and, st and students who are in um, design and art scenes today and then working with these technologies and so on, oftentimes I see a truly novel works that is perceived by them or by their peers emerge from them wrestling with the works of AI, mm -hmm. not by, I clicked it and I submitted it. Because at the end of the day, if any experts in that field are look at those texts or look at those images, for the untrained eyes, for the people who are new in that field may consider, oh, that is definitely creative from my standards. But what we consider as a creative is oftentimes uh, influenced by the social and cultural forces of that time. So we see today AI was able to achieve this much for beautiful word salad and introductions. But now we have seen that that is possible with the machine. Then next time when we engage in trying to write something, maybe we have a different standard upon which to judge what's con uh, considered as a creative. Mm -hmm. What is a novel text and images? Because the standard already is evolving based on what we have seen and experienced right now. So there, there's going to be kind of a shift in how we judge what's creative and I, I guess what's, what's creative and what creativity is. Yeah, it's, it's happening already. Mm -hmm. I think there was like a Reddit group that is curating uh, different types of like uh, image arts. And I think the story goes a, a, an art group actually, they created their own images, they draw and like created it and submitted it. And then the, the curator of that uh, Reddit thread is like, no, we are not going to accept the computer generated art. And it's like, but we actually made it. And then the person did not believe it. The editor, the curator did not believe it because, ah, oh, but aesthetic standard of this is actually very machine like. Mm. So that is a case of that curator from, from, from the third person perspective, seeing that interaction, hearing that story, then that curator's standard of what it considered as an authentic art has already evolved based on seeing multiple images and examples of. Um, AI generated, computer generated art. So AI obviously is impacting and really disrupting a lot of fields. And I remember, and if you bring us back a couple of years ago, 2016, I believe, the first kind of big social shock in the world was related with Korea, was when, um, does everyone remember AlphaGo? Um, so there was so DeepMind, the AI research lab, lab that's uh, owned by Google, um, created an AI program that plays the game of Go or Paduk in Korean, and they were able to defeat the reigning world champion Isador. And that was so. At that time, I remember there was a huge kind of outburst of conversation about AI is going to take over all of us. Like, what are we going to do? How do we, um, like, how do we like fight against this? And then, of course. Last year, ChatGPT kind of came out. So I'm curious, in your world, in kind of the design world that you're in, what would it take for what would what would AI need to do to kind of really shock 
the design world, do you think? What does AI need to do to really shock the design world? Let's see. Because I, because I want to point out that back then in 2016, mm -hmm. the game of Go was considered too complex right. for AI. Yeah. People thought, you know, chess, when um, mm -hmm. Kasparov played the IBM um, program back in 97 or 8, um, so chess was like, okay, that could be programmed by AI, but the game of Go was too complex, but mm -hmm. AI was able to defeat the world champion. Mm -hmm. So what would it take for AI to kind of really shock and disrupt the design world? Mm -hmm. Or is it doing it already? Beautiful. Well, also, that there's also a fun part about that story that has happened since 2017, right? Since that match. Um, there's a documentary that was actually released by DeepMinds and Google right. on, this, on this subject. And talk about how uh, champion Lisa Dole's reflections and process of playing the game together. And I think Lisa Dong, in fact, won the last game uh, during those matches. Right. He won. Yeah. He won one of the five. Yeah. Right. Um, and I believe only about the two months ago, there's now we have a human uh, Go champion who specialize in beating Alpha Zeros and Alpha Go models. Could they come up with a new strategy to engage with those? So I think that is kind of the interesting aspects of stories of AIs and shockings and different things. What really happens is that when these kind of technological artifact comes out and, in, and wow us in certain areas, certain features and things, what's really interesting is how people kind of perceive those things. And they may be surprised for a bit, but humanity is actually gets, really bo it gets bored really easily. <laughs> As soon as they, we figure out that is a way a strat, uh, that a certain artifacts are functioning, humans start coming up with a different way to engage with those. And this kind of thing in my research too, if humans and robots are engaging in a similar creative activity, like drawing, drawing a cups and different things, AI will try to execute it over and over and over in a similar way or in similar style, while humans, when they're asked to do the same thing over and over again, get so bored and end up like drawing clouds and, 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 and apples falling off the screen uh, and drawing totally different things beyond the confines of what that experiment was all about. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're actually seeing here is that it's a game of Go in other field. As soon as these types of models and things comes out, there might be the initial wow factor, mm -hmm. right? In a design field or in a, in a business w world, like, oh, this ad copy was written by AI or this rendering of this architectural design was using generative models. It's like, wow, that's interesting. Or, or the art piece has won the art, art, art festivals in, uh, in, in Colorado. The like AI art was, uh, was able to do that. And then after the headline passed away, people come up with a different way, mm -hmm. come up with a new way to engage with it. People come up with a way to break the AI models so that they can use it in a different way. And I think I get to kind of see that at my current job. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a five minute signal about five minutes ago, <laughs> but I'm going to steal another five minutes. <laughs> um, so this time I want to do a bit of a rapid fire, just quick questions, yes. you know, 10 second quick answers. Um, and then I believe we will have, give me five more minutes and then um, we'll hand around mics for additional questions. So uh, think of your questions. Um, you know, Koreans are not the most well known to raise hands in these sessions, but you know, we'll we'll do our best. Um, but we are really fast. We're, we're, we are buddy, very buddy. fast. <laughs> All right, so we we got some questions from the audience prior to the event, and I also added a couple more kind of you know short questions. Um, but I think these are questions that people are very curious about. So, rapid fire. Yeah. Will AI make people will AI make people dumber and lazier? Totally possible. Totally possible. Is it healthy to have such a connection with inanimate objects like machines as we interact with them, like we do with AI? I'm totally addicted to my phone, so it's probably not a good thing. <laughs> How worried should we be about work displacement due to AI? I think it's incredibly challenging, but I think we can figure out a better solution. So I'm going to leave it up to you guys to ask the <laughs> follow-up questions to these. 
Do you think there will be a global consensus on regulation of AI, or is that too far-fetched a dream? I think that's unlikely. What, what would be a more likely form? Country, uh, government by government? Country by corporations. I think there's an aspect of public policies and governments are oftentimes not the most proactive forces when it comes to uh, enacting changes, and which is okay because governments and laws are there for stabilities and, and understanding. I think we have a long way to go in terms of experimenting what kind of regulations and policies are actually going to be effective in reigning this kind of very complex dynamics. Do you think it can become dangerous if the government doesn't act quickly enough? I think the, not only the government, but the society and the people who are engaged in both development of technologies and uses of technology shares a responsibility together in terms of the danger of this technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a couple more from me. Um, you've not only changed jobs multiple times, but you've changed industries and fields multiple times. Where was the origin of that courage to take those leaps? Courage is a very generous word when it comes to thinking about uh, jumping around. Um, I think I was just dri driven by curiosity. Um, curiosity to figure out maybe this this group of people and this method maybe effective in enacting certain changes. I think I'm still driven by that. I don't think I'm done yet in terms of my journey. Can you share what your most popular class is and what you teach in it? My most popular class? Most popular class is a class that I end early. Okay. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> the subject of the class uh, that I've been, uh, we've been, I've been touching and uh, teaching with my collaborators and research collaborators like Andrew Shea uh, at Parsons School of Design. It's called AI Creativity and Social Justice. Um, also, I'm collaborating with a, another faculty called like, wonderful designer, Mark Rendell, and um, Design with AI, which is very focusing on artistic practice. And also, Abrima Warsha and the concept of metaverse and future of fashion with AI. What can young people do right now to prepare as the workforce gets more and more entangled with AI? How do they stand out? I think it's important for them to understand the technology, both its opportunity and limitations, and put that as a, one of their toolkits and things that they can carry on. All right. Um, I have one or two more things I'd like to close with. But before then, I'd like to open it up for questions to the audience. So um, the microphone runner will bring you the microphone for questions. You mentioned the Deep Blue defeated Kasparov in, in chess, and you mentioned AlphaGo's triumph in, in Go. What's the next great AI challenge? If AI can help us solve climate change, I think I'll be pretty happy with it. Is there, any, is, there any, is there anything the next, um, I, was, I was hoping you would say something along the, like the exponential progression in, in game skill or something re related to that line of thought. Yeah. As I, opposed to a, a massive global public policy problem. I think climate change I would consider is one aspect is a public policy, but when we're engaging in a complex problem like such, and also in the design world, we talk about it as a wicked problem that is very multi-dimensional problems. So what AlphaGo was able to do is able to tackle on that multi-dimensional uh, challenges of playing a game of Go through variations and reinforcement learnings that able to come up with an optimal solution that was timely to deal with that. Can we also think about AI models and, and technological artifacts and solutions that is help us to able to tackle on these complex issues that is outside of a board game? All right, uh, next question. As someone who's focused both on AI and also social justice, I'm curious how you see AI tackling issues like inequality. 
because mm-hmm. it seems to me that you know over the last six months we've seen the biggest, most powerful companies investing in AI, and I haven't really seen much in the way of how this will positively impact and reduce um, inequality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and to build on that, because the current models and advancements of AI is driven by internet data um, that is being extracted uh, without acknowledgement and also without compensation. Every time when the image is made, we're using certain models. Uh, where are the compensation for the people who contributed that data? So current construct of a lot of popular AI model have significant equity issues um, to begin with. All that said, the opportunity lies in, I think, both way and in two level. One is availability of a lot of these models to both academic researchers and everyday people. So there are significant movements among both computer scientists and industries and academia on creating an open source models of these types of technologies so that different new companies, not just the, the major players in Silicon Valley, but new companies have access to these tools to generate and create new solutions. The other aspects I think that's really important is how can we bring in a new group of people and diverse group of people to look at this technology and trying to see it, how it fit from their perspective into the challenges they're facing. There's only so much a major corporations and technology firms can do a top-down solution into world's problem. But if we're able to give these types of tools and also conduct research and development with NGOs, with uh, activists, then we can come up with a different ways that this technology can be used. I don't see this as, um, and I think one more thing I would add is that given the fact that we are in a certain media environment and a history of thinking about this concept, and the AI is some kind of amorphous one giant thing that's kind of coming over the, the civilization like a giant cloud. The reality is that's not true. Um, a lot of these AIs are oftentimes a, a machine learning algorithm with a certain types of data sets. And each of them models are kind of functioning as its own. Um, scholars like Melanie Mitchell talks about it as like, ah, this AI is kind of funny, this AI is kind of not funny. Um, we got to start to diverse, uh, come up with a more understanding about these tools in a more, more critical and diverse perspective. So in that way, yeah, like ChatGPT might be super extractive in terms of how it's made and um, is able to provide business value for major corporations, but maybe we'll be able to develop a new types of AI model that is much more focusing on and tackling on the issues of social inequality to economic distribution. Next question. Uh, so, uh, Museum of Modern Arts have an AI exhibit that's ingesting all the modern arts in the museum mm-hmm. and then creating uh, modern art uh, in real time. Uh, do you think that's something revolutionary in the field of design and art, or is that mainstream? And in this case, do we say that it's the developer who created that program? Uh, is that person creative, or is the AI creative? Thank you. I think you're talking about the Rafik Andol's piece yeah. at MoMA uh, exhibition. Well, it has Rafik's names on it. <laughs> and I'm sure he got the commission to work on that project. Um, what we consider as artistic and creative is determined by the, the people in the society they live today. So what's significant is that uh, generative arts and computer-made art has entered into the art and design circles um, in the institutions like MoMA. I think there's a significant aspects of that. But both of the challenges for the new young designers and and emerging designers and emerging artists is, okay, so that's been done. Rafik has done that. The question is, what's next? What are the new concepts and ideas we can push for, either using this technology or not using this technology? to create a meaningful artistic statement that resonates with people today. Because the novelty of, because it's made by AI, it's cool, 
that's fading away pretty quickly. So do you think the inherent value of you producing an art versus an AI changes based on like now that we know that AI can generate arts that can somehow fundamentally do not be differentiated from if a person created that, does the value change now? Like, what is that? art to you? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's an expression of uh, uh, in whatever form I kind of uh, unleash my creativity. Mm -hmm. If that is inherently coming from you, then no matter what machine does, does that matter? To me, it does not. But as a society, uh, how do we like predict that? Like, how would that change? Well, by start with talking to other members of the society and shaping what we consider as an artist. Makes sense. Thank yeah. you. I have no control over who gets the mic, so don't look at me. <laughs> okay, I'm listening, and um, I have a few thoughts that will somehow become a question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things you said was that um, things like Chapjit will now, in, to a certain extent, be like a form of competition with human beings. Like, okay, now that's the standard. We as human beings are bored, so we are going to somehow proceed that. Um, mm -hmm. Me personally, I am not that idealistic because um, there are some people are, but the most part, I see people in the lower road being like lazy and just relying on like mm -hmm. becoming more innovative. So there will be like a big divide between people who are using it to excel and people mm -hmm. who are using it to just get by. Mm -hmm. So, and I can see, foresee that just being a cycle that repeats itself because once one generation becomes um, complacent, then the next mm -hmm. generation just follows suit, and the mm -hmm. next suit, and one generation that does that is competing with AI and are basically upping their value game, they will continue upping their value game, and I can see that there might be a big divide that mm -hmm. will never be crossed. Uh, is I don't know how that becomes a question, but yeah, I'm just mm -hmm. um, that's a question in a way, I guess. Yeah, I think so. The observation that um, like. If, <laughs> if I'm a high school student, if ChatGPT just wrote me an essay on Othello in like two seconds, will that high school student just submit that or are they going to like labor over it overnight? <laughs> right? <laughs> Tough question, right? Uh, we know what's going to happen. The, and I think that is exactly why it's important for these types of tools has to be developed in a different way. Um, output should be come out different ways. Um, so on the industry side and the researcher side, I think it's superbly important to push for how these technologies actually enter into society. Um, some of the researchers and creative practitioners that I met in another large corporations, they actually had this types of technology for, for more than like five years. But they had an ethical standard to how to release these technologies in a meaningful way that was not disrupting people's livelihood. And so kudos to them for incredible ethical uh, consideration they brought in. But now the cat is out of the box, right? So industry can engage, seeing the impact it's making with youth is especially, shaping that tool into a way that it makes sense in classrooms and other environments are incredibly important. At the same time, I think it's also very important for, for us, us as in society, both I'm an educator um, and researcher, to, to start to think about maybe the things that we look for in the Othello essay is not a just repetitions of what happens in synopsis. Maybe I should be looking for the meanings that is personal to that to that person and how that's ideas are novel throughout across multiple points in time. So then we're thinking education in a different way. Um, you're not reciting the synopsis of Othello, but rather how that Othello's and themes is meaningful to you in the beginning of the class, at the end of the class. Then we start to think about it in a different way. What is an artistic pursuit? How do we understand literature? Uh, less as a regurgitation of facts, which is what ChatGPT is kind of doing. We have time for about two more questions. One more. So I have questions too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. These are beautiful questions. Thank you. 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just open for a comment and just ask one question. Um, first of all, my, my understanding is that most copyright lawyers agree that um, uh, AI created endeavors are not copyrightable due to specific legal precedents that state that a human has to create the endeavor to make it copyrightable. But my question uh, is more about um, bias, because um, th there's a lot of concern um, about the, you know the data sets being biased mm -hmm. and big uh, research groups f firing their bi their bias officers in their their, their you know their powering down of their workforce mm -hmm. and making their their biased research mm -hmm. proprietary and not releasing what they know about the biases. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do you see about combating uh, AI bias? Mm -hmm. uh, specific since the corporations creating it, uh, frankly, don't care. Mm -hmm. I think us talking about it is the first step. I think that a lot of people are being angry about it is the first step. Being actively engaging and pointing out why certain types of model that exist um, has into the market is incredibly biased. I think that's the first step of a citizen engagement in pushing back on the product that's already released. Second aspect, because why that's important, is because of that push, corporations are has to mitigate come up with new ethical standards and new uh, bias control teams to enact protocols and things. But that's also one piece of the puzzle, right? The other aspects I think is important for tackling the bias is for us to look at AI less as this, as this kind of divine incarnations of things that is, exist in a society. If I have a crazy uncle who is saying crazy things, I'm going to think, ah, oh, that's a crazy uncle saying crazy things. If I am able to approach AI and output that way, have much more nuanced perspective of what it's doing, then I do not have to rely upon and also impact so much by the bias that's creating. And the last thing is ability for either NGOs, social justice organizations, or governments, um, for them to be able to create their own models, I think is very important. If they're able to oversee the labeling processes that goes into data, uh, these trainings, if they have a power to influence that and mitigate and see what's going in to making, this, making the sausage, and able to develop the models on their own, then another way we can diversify the perspectives and these kind of one giant construct with the, with the biases affecting from policing to um, to predictive models can change dramatically. But it's a battle because it's a very data driven approach of we are building this AI. All right, um, I'm going to shoot two very quick questions and then we're going to close it off. Um, after listening to you answer the questions from the audience, is there any misconception about AI that you want to dispel that like frustrates you every time someone brings something up? Yeah, the AI is not monolithic. Uh, it's, it's a multitude and it is shaped by people just like you and me. Uh, it's not a some, some uh, special algorithm that have been generated from the heaven and came down to the earth. There's so much news about AI. There's new things coming out every day. How do we keep up? Good question. How do you keep up? Well, there is a lot of doom scrolling do happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe kind of this kind of pulls us back into thinking about as we are so much in the thick of it, it's, it's really important for us to kind of take a moment to be able to step back, right? If we're able to approach this idea of an AI, the construct of AI, less as a thing that is advancing so fast and if I don't adopt it right now, my business is going to go down. If I don't adapt it into my professional life, the other person is going to do it. If we're in that mindset, of AI is some inevitable future that's going to impact everything that we do and we're just stuck in it and we're going to be reactive to this technological development by others. If we're in that thinking, then it's depressing and there's no way one can be able to stay on top of that development. But 
if we were to think about as an AI itself, is an artifact that is driven by a certain group of people. Understanding its disciplinary bias and uh, disciplinary biases, as in in what way we're constructing this, what types of ideas and thoughts are went into, who are behind developing these things. If we were able to look at it more systematically, then we're able to see the development as a branch itself that's emerging. So we have a little bit more views. So then even though, yes, the next image model has come out, the next model is, is able to do this and that, I only see that as a more of a development of the curve that is going somewhere rather than as I'm constantly at the edge of a falling cliff. And having able to have the bird eye view, able to construct those ideas about technological development is important, not just to AI, but all other technologies as well. And then the question for us is, I'm seeing that development. The question we got to ask ourselves is, what is my role in the shaping that? Am I writing to my congressman and congresswoman, congressman? Am I engaging in the development? Am I using these tools in a certain way? Am I talking about these technologies in a certain way? Um, am I sharing ideas in, an, in a way that this type of technology can be, can be changed? If everyone is engaged in activity that is able to push towards the vision that we want what this technology can be, then the incremental things that we're seeing every day can nudge towards a better, uh, better arc than what we have. I hear um, cups and food and drinks getting set up in the back, so I'm not. I'll, I won't keep you too long. Um, keeping with the theme of this being a young professionals mm -hmm. network event, um, and we're all young here. So, if what final piece of advice would you give to people who are maybe exploring, studying uh, potentially a career opportunity in the field that you're in? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing for me is like never feel like because I've come from somewhere, because I'm coming from this background, because I have this inclination, I can't possibly know that or I can't possibly do that. I think that's a, that's a false notion. Anybody can enable to understand different types of concepts to a degree. Of course, I'm not going to be the expert in the new thing, but I can work with the expert next to me and better understand how it's going to make sense to the world that I'm creating, world that I'm engaging in. And always be curious and figuring that new things out so that you're able to shape the development in a way that you consider as impactful. I think that's really important. We so easy for us to think about, because I've done this all my life, I cannot do this new thing. I think that's limiting ourselves. And that types of thinking also limits our society from moving forward and able to come up with new solutions. So more of that barrier goes down, both within my own mindset and within the society, then I think we can see a better future. Well, with that, I uh, want to thank the Korea Society for making this possible. Please give a warm round, uh, round of applause to Professor Jong-Gi Lim.